And so this is the first in a series of student skill sessions. Um, so this one's looking at imposter syndrome. We also have a workshop on communicating your research effectively. And the final one is on PhD thesis writing. So today I have the pleasure of introducing Hugh Kearns. Hugh, Hugh lectures and researches at Flinders University in Australia. He is widely recognized for his ability to take the latest research in psychology and education and apply it to high performing people and groups. With his co-author, Maria Gardner, he has published 10 books which are in high demand both in Australia and internationally. He's recognized internationally as a public speaker, educator and researcher, and he regularly lectures at universities across the world. He's currently on a tour at the moment. <laughs> and with his areas of expertise, including self-management, positive psychology, work-life balance, learning and creativity. So can we give a warm welcome to you on his talk on imposter syndrome. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, welcome along. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself and then we'll find out about you and we'll talk about this thing called the imposter syndrome. So, a bit about me. Uh, I live in Adelaide, uh, down there at the bottom of South Australia, uh, where it is early summer right now and it's gonna be 25 degrees at the moment, so I've, been, I've chosen the wrong place to come at this time of year. And I have a few jobs. One is at a university there called Flinders University and do some lecturing and researching. And my area of interest in research is this idea of self-management. How do you manage yourself? And I'm especially interested in why people don't manage themselves. That's things like procrastination, overcommitment, distraction, perfectionism, all those things that people are really, really good at. And so I tend to look at people, find out how they do those things, and then come back and talk, write books about it, and so forth. And um, one of the things that underlies a lot of those is that sort of doubt or that imposter syndrome sort of causes a lot of those sort of things to happen. And that's why I suppose I work on this area a little bit. Uh, most of my time, though, is not at my university at all these days. It's running a company called Thinkwell and traveling around Australia or all around the world, talking to people like you or universities or researchers about how to be more effective at what you might do. And uh, my, my colleague, we've written a series of books all around these topics, turbocharging your writing, managing your time. If you want to find out more, there's a website called ithinkwell.com.au and our research is published there. There's lots of resources and materials on that website. It's a good place to go if you want to procrastinate about doing your own work. You can go and read all our stuff and get distracted by that. Um, and on that book, uh, on that website, there's a book which I've written about the imposter syndrome and it's available on that website. I've left a copy with Leanne as well and people can have a look at it if you want. If you've been listening carefully so far, you'll think that does not sound like a very Australian accent. Uh, and that's right, because I'm from a place called Sligo, which is over there on the west coast of Ireland. And my degree <laughs> from Sligo as well, May, oh, close by, yeah, not very far away. And my degree a very long time ago was in agricultural science at University College Dublin. And then I moved out of science into education for a while, and then the last 25 years or so into psychology. But in particular, psychology of high performers, of how they work and so forth. And that's what you'll see a little bit as we go through the, uh, the afternoon. So that's me. Um, as we go through the afternoon, I'm going to get you to say hello to a few people. So you might have to say hello to people beside you nearby. So I'll get you to tell people uh, what your name is, what you do. But in particular, what do you know about this thing called the imposter syndrome? Have you ever heard about it before? Or do you know anything about it or nothing about it at all? So say hello to a few people and off we go. So. And the interesting thing about uh, when you have these feelings, you know, that I, I don't fit in, uh, then we all make up reasons why. Uh, it'd be, I, I, got, I got onto the fellowship or I'm on that council because nobody else applied. You know, they just didn't have anybody else or they wanted a woman on it or they wanted some person like that. That's why you come up with all these reasons. And because it doesn't make sense to us, so you have to rationalize it in some way for yourself. And so it's a very common in lots of areas. Other areas where you're li very likely to feel it is if you're the first to do something. If you're the first in your family to go to university, it's going to be hard because none of your family knows how to do it. You think, I don't fit in here. This isn't what we do. If you're the first in your family to do a PhD, nobody else has done that. And they're all looking at you. Oh, you're so brilliant. You're so clever. And you're thinking, well, I don't feel that clever. So when you do anything for the first. Um, I was working in a, a university department. There was one woman in, in a group of 100 P, um, computer science students. <laughs> one woman, all these other men all around. And of course, that's really hard because now not only is she representing herself, <laughs> She is representing 50% of humanity <laughs> because if she gets it wrong, it's not just her, it's, well, women can't do these things. And so you bow the weight of that expectation on you. Will I be able to do it? So it's a very public way. So if you're, if you're any way unusual or different, then that's why an imposter, I don't fit in. 
And I don't know if that makes it a bit harder, but it doesn't mean you're an imposter. So that's interesting to, to discuss, but it's more interesting to try it out. And I'm going to do a little exercise with you because when I was coming here to the Linnaean Society, I was talking to Leanne and others, and I said, uh, I run this, work, this, this lecture given all around the world, some of the top organizations. And I just wanted to find out who was coming along uh, this afternoon. And I said to Leanne, could you send me through some background details about them, you know, their achievements, what they've done so far. And while you were upstairs, I had to look through. <laughs> and I'm afraid there's some disturbing news. <laughs> there's one person who shouldn't be here. And I'm going to walk through and tap that person on the shoulder now. <laughs> <laughs> and say, look, you've done well to get this far, but I'm afraid there's been some sort of a mistake. <laughs> and if you could leave quietly now, <laughs> we won't make a fuss. We might just be able to say, look, it was a bit of an administrative error or whatever. And as I'm walking through, most people are thinking, he's talking about me. <laughs> I'm the one who shouldn't be here. And your second thought is, how did they find out? <laughs> Was at that last meeting, I did the wrong thing or whatever. And this is the experience of the imposter syndrome, which is that feeling, even though you know I didn't check the stuff, you know, that, that's, but despite you knowing it, your, your brain automatically goes, hang on, maybe they did, how do we know? And you automatically have that reaction. And that's the feeling that you were just one mistake away from being found out as a complete fraud. And that happens immediately, not well before you can rationally think it through. You automatically, your brain just dumps, maybe it is. And there's a couple things about it. The first one is, it's a secret. You can never check it out. Because if you put up your hands and said, I think I'm the imposter, <laughs> there's always the risk that I could have said, yep, I told you there was one. <laughs> so you have to leave. So you have to sit there with a straight face and don't blink and hope nobody finds out. <laughs> You know when you're having a meeting with your colleagues or whatever or in your department and they explain something to you and they say, now, you understand that, don't you? And we all go, oh, yes, I understand. <laughs> and then you rush out and you go onto Google to try and find out what they were talking about. Because you can't say no, because they just explained it. You look foolish. And so you've got to pretend you know. And of course, all the other people in the meeting, they're all nodding. I think they all know, <laughs> but they don't know either. And so it's this sort of conspiracy where everyone has to pretend you've got everything under control, but inside everyone's thinking, no idea what's going on here. And the second thing about it is, it's impervious to evidence. It doesn't matter how much evidence you're not an imposter, you're still going to feel like it. Because that's what people think, once I get one more piece of qualification, what, then I won't feel like it. But what I'm going to show you is it just gets worse and worse, you know, it doesn't go away. Even despite all the evidence, it doesn't make any difference. You're still going to have that feeling. And so that makes it a bit weird, really, because I want you to think about this. Here you have evidence that you're not an imposter, but you still feel like it. And so that's pretty weird from a psychology point of view. And so what you have to do is come up with pretty weird uh, logic to get rid of this weird feeling. And what we do is we uh, misattribute successes. When good things happen to you, let's say you get onto the fellowship or whatever it might be, you attribute it to luck. I was lucky. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I was walking by the door and they said, will you be a fellow? Or will you go on the council or whatever like that? And so luck, uh, we attribute all our success to luck. Now there's no doubt, luck plays an important part in all of our lives. <laughs> However, if you're that lucky that you've managed to get this far in life, <laughs> you should be out buying lottery tickets. <laughs> Because clearly you lead a charmed existence. You know, everything's just fallen into your place for you. So a luck plays a part, but you had to actually work as well. And there's a little quote that says, the harder you work, the luckier you become. You know, you put the effort in, things seem to happen. The other one is that we, had, we say it was an easy task. I, I know I, 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 I did that art exhibition, that was good, but that was easy, really. Anybody could have done one of them. You know, that wasn't that special. Because, of course, in retrospect, everything looks easy. You know, that problem you were struggling with a month ago, you couldn't find the answer, but then when you see the answer, oh, that's obvious. I don't know why it took me so long. Anybody could have done that. <laughs> in retrospect, everything looks easy. When you're doing it, it's not that easy. Uh, we attribute our success to other people. Uh, like PhD students do this all the time. Uh, it was only because of my supervisor. My supervisor was wonderful. They did most of the work anyway. Or you're part of a group. It was the team who did most of the work. I was just going along for the ride, really. I didn't do very much at all. Uh, and women in particular find this uh, hard to own their own successes. They will attribute it to other people around them and say, it was the other person did this thing. Now, of course, your supervisor or people around you do have a role to play, but you have to do your part as well. It's not all about the other person. Uh, that was then, this is different. Yeah, I was successful then, but that's a completely different world. I have now moved into a new situation, so none of my past experience matters at all. 
And of course, your situation is new, but the fact you were successful before is a bit of a predictor for your next thing as well. So the fact you could do one thing well means maybe you could do the next one well as well. But we say, no, it's a different situation. Nothing works at all. I I've written about 10 books on these topics. And uh, you know, every time you write a book, you think, I wonder, will this one work? Oh, no, this is going to be awful. <laughs> Despite the fact the other ones seem to be successful, maybe this one will be okay as well. But no, we go, oh, no, that doesn't count at all. It's a different area. And then the last one is a really nasty one. It's, uh, you do say you're successful, but that was only because I worked so hard. I had to work 10 times harder than everybody else. And that just proves how stupid I am, because if I was clever, I should be able to get up and do it without effort. Because not only do you want brilliance, but you want brilliance without effort. Because that's what we assume other people do. Other people can just sit at their desk, waft their fingers over a keyboard, and a nature article comes out the other end, or a best-selling novel. Well, that's really nice, but that's not the way it works in reality, but that's what our brain is. If you work hard, it just proves how slow you are, because you're just a dullard, you should be able to do it easily. So I'll give you a moment, just tell people, which is your favorite way of getting rid of evidence you don't like? You know, somebody says, well done, you've done a good thing. How do you diminish it or get rid of that evidence that you don't like? So tell people, what's your favorite way? So these are all little strategies we use to get rid of evidence. And, to, and, to, and the problem is that keeps fostering the belief that I can't do it. I'm not, I've somehow managed to sneak through in some way. I ran this at Oxford University uh, last year, I think it was. And a guy came up to me, and um, he was from India, and he said he was an imposter. And I was asking him why. And what had happened was he had applied to Oxford the previous year, and he hadn't been successful. So he had to go back, go through the process, and apply again. And he got in the second time. But of course, that was no good at all because he should have got in on the first time. They just give it to him because he was persistent. You know, he just kept knocking on the door enough they're going to give it to him, despite the fact that he was there on merit. But that's the thing, because really clever people get in the first time, you know, whatever. I remember one woman in Australia, she won some prestigious fellowship or in her university. But the problem was there were four fellowships, for instance. Uh, she had applied, and she was number five. But one of the first four didn't accept the fellowship, went somewhere else, so she got moved up. But she said, they didn't really want me at all. You know, they only gave it to me because someone else didn't want it. And so, despite the fact, you know, she's got it, she's earned it. But no, it's because they really wanted to give it to somebody else. Another one that happens when you, you apply for a job or get a promotion is nobody else must have applied. <laughs> they couldn't find anybody else. You know, that's the thing. We, do, we assume if they've chosen me, it was must because there was no one else around. So these are, these are unhelpful because they take away your success. And they start making you believe maybe this is true. And so... Uh, when uh, you do, uh, one of the ways to notice this is when you get a compliment and people say, oh, it was luck, anybody could have done it. You, well, that's not very helpful. So when you get a compliment, the next time all you have to do is say, thank you very much. <laughs> you don't have to minimize it and say it was nothing. You just have to say thank you and move on from there. So um, we're now going to look at how people respond to the imposter syndrome or these feelings. And uh, again, you might notice a fraud in there, but um, there, there are two strategies. One is work really, really hard. Just work 10 times harder than you need to. Or the second one is avoid. And we'll look briefly at both of them. And the first one is uh, the working hard. And I have a little model I describe called the imposter cycle. And what happens is you start off here feeling like a fraud. I'm not OK. I'm not so good. And, and as human beings, we love to have reasons for things. Why do I feel like that? So we have to look for reasons. So we look for a reason. And if we can't find a real reason, we just make up reasons. We just make up random reasons, really. And let's say you're working with a group of people, and they all have a qualification or some sort of a certificate. And you're thinking, I know, they all look OK. They've got a certificate. If I had a certificate like that too, then I'd feel OK as well, because that must be what it is. And so now you sign up for the certificate, and you work hard to achieve the target. And so now you still feel like a fraud, but now you've got hope. And the hope is, once I graduate or get the certificate, I'm going to feel OK. I'm going to fit in. And so you work hard, and you actually achieve the target. You get your qualification or your certificate. And then you get a momentary pleasure. And the momentary pleasure usually lasts as long as it takes to walk from one side of the podium to the other side with your certificate. Because <laughs> when you get over to the other side, the glow wears off, and you still feel like a fraud. And now you've got a certificate, and you still feel like a fraud. <laughs> so you still feel like a fraud, and you have to look for a reason. And the first thing you must do is discount the previous reason and say, that was the wrong certificate. <laughs> what I really need is a diploma. If I had a diploma, that would really work. 
So you decide to sign up for a diploma and you work hard to achieve the target and you're doing really well. And as you get to the end of the diploma, you say, well, the diploma is just a starting point, really. What you need is a bachelor's degree. So you decide to sign up for a bachelor's degree and you go really well in the bachelor's degree and you get to the end of that and they're saying, oh, you're doing really well, but what you really need is a master's degree. That's what anybody clever has to have because you're hanging around with these other people who have this thing called a master's. So you think, I better sign up for one of them. So off you go and you sign up and get your master's and you think, now I'm going to make it. <laughs> but as you get to the end of the master's, they say, well, what you really need is the PhD because you're hanging around with these other people who look really clever, who all seem to have a PhD, and think, I need one of them. So you sign up, and that, that's the highest you can go, surely, at that point. So you sign up for the PhD, and round you go. But as you get to the PhD, they say, well, but the PhD is just a start, really. You really need to do a postdoc, or you need to get a PhD and four papers, or whatever it is. You're just starting the business. Because, of course, towards the end of your PhD, you're hanging around with really clever people now, you know, really smart people. And so the bar keeps going higher and higher. And that's how you can be really successful, but still feel like a fraud all the way around. And in fact, you know, this, this part here, this is where you can be really successful. It makes you work hard. And in fact, in fact, after a while, people begin to think the imposter syndrome is what makes me successful. And it's the only reason I do things to prove that I'm not a fraud. If you took away my imposter syndrome, I would just lie on the sofa all day watching daytime TV. You know, I wouldn't have any reason to get up in the morning. And the reality is, if you want to go and do these things, just do them because you want to do them. Not because it's going to get rid of the imposter syndrome or the feelings, because it isn't. They'll still be there at the end of all that. You'll just have more qualifications, more experience, but you're still going to feel the same at the end of all that. So the, where, do you, where do you go with this? What you have to do is go back to that square up there, feeling like a fraud, not okay. And what I'm telling you is, that's fine. Get used to that feeling. It doesn't go away. Everybody feels like that occasionally. You don't have to go and get rid of it. If you want to do something, do it, but not because of getting rid of that feeling, because it isn't going to work anyway. And so that's the problem is we think, I'm, I have to, one more thing, then I'll feel okay, or then it'll all work out. So I'm going to give you a moment now. Tell people, uh, can you recognize the imposter cycle? You might have been honored a few times yourself. Qualifications, experience, awards, all those things round and round you go, gathering more and more trinkets along the way, but still feeling like a fraud. So tell people, any, any experiences of the imposter cycle? All right. So that's the imposter cycle, how you can be really successful and still feel like I don't fit in. The other way of dealing with it is to avoid being found out, avoid putting yourself into situations. And again, there's a few ways to do that. Uh, the first one is uh, just don't try at all. You know, don't apply. If you don't apply for a job, you can't fail. And so, you know, just don't bother at all. And so that's a fairly easy strategy. I'll see that regularly with people. I might work with somebody who says, I want to apply for a new job or a promotion. But they never seem to apply. And then a job appears in the paper and you say, why don't you apply for that one? And they'll go, oh, they have all these reasons why they won't do it. It's the wrong time. Oh, there's one criteria I don't meet. Someone has already applied for that. <laughs> the real reason is, if they applied for it and didn't get it, it would be devastating. So it's better not to try at all. If you don't put your hand up, you can't get found out. Because the concern is, if I apply, I don't get it, they'll realize I'm a fraud. So just don't try. The other one is, uh, don't try hard. You might get involved in something, but you don't try. And I see that with students all the time secondary school into high school, you've got a clever kid, uh, they could do well on the exam, but they don't try. And then when they fail, well, it wasn't because I was stupid, it was because I didn't try. So it gives you an excuse. Because, of course, if you tried hard and didn't go well, we can only assume you're stupid. And so it's, it's, it gives you that protective thing. I didn't bother. And you sort of make a big deal. But, and you have to make sure you tell everybody you didn't try as well. Oh, I didn't study at all. You know, I just woke up last night and did this thing. I didn't even bother trying. So that's one of the good excuses. Another one is to procrastinate. And that's where you put things off. And how that one works is, let's say, again, you have a, an assignment or a task due on fri next Friday. <laughs> so you leave everything until late on Thursday night. And then you pull an all-nighter. And if it doesn't go so well, you can say, well, if I only started last night. If I had more time, I would have done really well. Because again, if you start early and work all the way through and it doesn't work out, we can only assume you're stupid or not capable. So by waiting to the last minute, you have that excuse. A lot of people say to me, they work best under last minute pressure. <laughs> what they should really say is, I only work under last minute pressure. <laughs> Never tried anything else. Maybe if you started earlier, it might actually go well. 
And the last one is overcommitment, and that's a good one as well. So that one, how that one works is, again, you have some task you'd like to do next week, but uh, you, you take on all these other commitments. You know, somebody doesn't turn up, I'll do their job, I'll take on all this extra stuff. And then when it comes to Friday and they say, where's your thing? <laughs> well, I couldn't do that, but look at all the other stuff I had to do. And so that gives you an excuse. Uh, I couldn't do it because I was so busy. And it's good if you make a lot of worthy causes, you know, save the whales, save the trees, help little old ladies across the road. You've got all these worthy causes and people say, well, I can see why you didn't do that because you have all this other stuff. But it gives you an excuse. They can't find out because I have all this other stuff going on. So that's how people avoid being found out. They sort of throw people off the scent by having other reasons. It's not my lack of ability, it's this other stuff. And that protects you from that. So Joe said, uh, what do we do about this? We've discovered what it is, but what do you do about it? So I'm going to go through a few strategies with you. And so I'm going to give you 10 different approaches. And I might get you to think about which one works for you. But, but the first one is <laughs> begin to realize imposter feelings are normal. It's not some disease you have or some sort of genetic uh, inability. It's normal. Uh, what I'd be saying is most people will feel like that when you come up into some new situation. So it's pretty normal. So most people will occasionally feel like an imposter, especially in new situations. So when you take on a new job and you feel like an imposter, welcome to the human race. That's fairly normal. Nothing weird about it. Just accept that that's the case. The second one is realize feelings are not facts. You can feel something, even very strongly, and it might not be true. I'll give you an example of that. I'll meet somebody who walks out of an exam and say, oh, that's the worst exam I've ever done. I'm sure I failed. And then you meet them a few weeks later, and they get a good grade. Well, how did that work? <laughs> well, they were stressed, or maybe they got one thing wrong, but it doesn't tell you what really happened. So you can feel that you're not doing so well and still be going fine. Like I'll give you an example of my experience. I'll often run these workshops and I'll think, oh, that one didn't go so well, you know, they didn't seem too happy. And you look at the evaluations and they were fine. There was nothing about it, it was just I was just feeling, it was probably something I was feeling at that point, not what really happened. So you can feel like you're a fraud and not be a fraud. Uh, the next one is you need to straighten out your thinking. If I had more time, I would show you how to use some cognitive behavioral coaching to identify assumptions and facts. And that's when you say, everybody else can do this. And like you said, anybody could do a PhD. I think, well, is that really true? You know, 99% of the population don't have PhDs. I wonder what that's about. You know, maybe some people could, they couldn't. But you have to look out, is that really true? So we make these assumptions, wild assumptions about things that we don't know. Like, uh, they only gave me it because they couldn't find anybody else. Is that really likely to be the case? And force yourself to straighten out your thought processes. The next one is to mind your language. And so that, that means don't discount your achievements. When, when somebody says, well done, you don't have to go, oh, it was nothing, anybody could have done it. You just have to say, thank you. And again, because that's very important, because when somebody gives you a compliment, and you say, oh, it was nothing, anyone can done it, it's a bit rude, really, because you've just thrown the compliment back in their face. They've just said something nice to you. Uh, but the real problem is, first of all, they hear it, and they go, well, maybe it wasn't anything. But even worse, you hear it yourself, and you start to believe your own propaganda. Well, maybe it was nothing. Maybe anybody could get a PhD. You go, hang on, maybe, is that really true? And so you have to watch your language. Uh, again, yourself, but also, let's say you have young kids. They'll come home and they get a good grade. Oh, it was nothing. And you go, no, you had to work hard for this. You know, you had to put the effort in. Uh, the next one is create a fact file and a brag file. And a fact file is a file that contains evidence about your achievements. Like, I have a fact file. When I run these workshops, sometimes I get emails saying, oh, that was good, you did a good job, it was a great course, whatever. They all go into my fact file. Because every now and again, I'll get an email that says, that was crap. <laughs> and if you, have 100, if you have 100 emails, 99 of them are good, and one bad one, what do you spend the evening thinking about? The one bad one. <laughs> and so when I get that one bad one, I go back to the fact file, and I read the other 99 good ones, and I go, that one person, they're weird. <laughs> they're wrong. <laughs> Because otherwise, you focus in on the negatives. You know, like, again, perfectionists will look at all the one bad one. You've got to remember, most of them is really good. So you need to, but you also need a fact file because you won't be able to get the good evidence when you need it. When you're having your imposter moments, you can't think very clearly. And you need to be able to go and look at the sheet of paper. One person, one PhD student, what she did was she printed out all her certificates and put them up on the wall in front of her computer. And when she was having her imposter moment, she said, that's my name. I did those things. And so it reminds you, you have evidence. 
Uh, the next one is to set objective standards. Because one of the things high achieving people do is they keep moving the goalposts. <laughs> like, the, let's say your art exhibition, you'll say, look, if I can just get through the art exhibition without fainting or whatever, I'll be happy, or if nobody recans it. And then it goes okay, but, oh, but it could have been better. I should have had more people, I should have sold more pictures or whatever it is. So after the event, you change the standards. And that's not fair. And so what you have to do is stop moving the goalposts after the event. So if you're going to go and do a task or do an exam or whatever it is, what you need to do beforehand is sit down and say, if it goes like this, I'll be happy, and write it down. And then after the event, you compare with the real standard rather than just changing the rules later. <laughs> I remember meeting a woman at my university and she said, if I could just get my PhD, I'd be so happy, I'd be made up. And then I met her later and I said, well, you must be happy now because you've got it. And she said, oh, well, but it did, it did take me so long to do it. I took twice as long as everybody else, or it should have been from Harvard or other places. And so she's moving the goalposts after the event, which isn't very fair. The next one is gather evidence and do some behavioral experiments. And that means try things out and see, does it work? People say, oh, no one will listen to my ideas. Well, maybe if you tried it, you could see if that, they'd never consider me for that job. Well, that's maybe you go and talk to them and see if that's really the case. So we have all these assumptions, oh, they'd never consider someone like me for that. Well, maybe I need to go and check it out. So try things out to see if your assumptions are accurate. Uh, number eight is know your imposter moments. Because <laughs> there are going to be times when you're going to feel like an imposter. And I told you what they are already, when you speak in public. You know, when you're, when you're in a meeting and you put your hand up and say, I have a question, you're probably going to feel like an imposter. Maybe it's not a very good question, or you ask people at a meeting. Uh, when you write things down, you're going to feel like an imposter, especially in academia. When you write it down or do something, they're going to realize that. Or when you make a mistake. Because <laughs> when something goes wrong, you immediately get overcome by that, oh, I've got to go find out. And so what you have to realize is when something goes wrong, yeah, I'm going to feel like an imposter. Hang on for a few minutes. It'll go away. It doesn't mean it's true. It just means I'm going to feel like that for a while. Uh, but otherwise, you start to believe it, and you start to build up a whole story around it. So be prepared for when things go wrong. Especially if any of you are doing research, things go wrong all the time. You're going to feel bad. Well, that's okay. That's what research is like. Number nine is get used to your imposter feelings, because they aren't going to go away. Because that's what people say to me, how do I get rid of these things? And I'm saying, no, you don't get rid of it. You just get used to it. You go, it's a bit like public speaking anxiety. It doesn't go away, but you learn to manage the nerves and get over that thing. It's the same with that feeling of, can I do something? Well, maybe we'll see and try. And then the last one is to be brave and take action. Because you can spend all your time doubting yourself, wondering, can you do it? But at some point, you just have to jump in and have a go. And I like this quote. It says, uh, a great deal of talent is lost to the world for want of a little courage. And I'm sure you know people, either yourself or other people, who have great abilities and gifts, but they never want to take the risk and try it out. Which is a bit sad for them, but also for the rest of us, really, because we miss out on their gifts and abilities because they just, they're just too afraid to take that step and jump out and do it. So they're the, set, the, the 10 strategies.